I think compliance reasons scare a lot of people. I think people are very frightened of technology that's not FDA approved. I think people find that it's that's a barrier and it shouldn't be. People should be able to access the non-FDA approved technology. You're gonna have to do the same validation anyway when you're internally validating it. And the College of American Pathologists gives you really good resources. I mean, they basically tell you you know, step by step what you need to do in order to produce a validation that's considered acceptable, which is, you know, it's just like any other laboratory test. I think that just knowing that, that there are options out there that aren't FDA approved and that the, the validation, the internal validation that you're gonna have to do is gonna be exactly the same, whether it's FDA approved or not FDA approved. So really, you know, like if you think the technology is good, then it's good enough, right? Learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry, meet the most interesting people in the niche, and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Zhurov. Welcome, my digital pathology trailblazers. Today, my guest is Dr. Elizabeth Ploharczyk, and she is a pathologist at Ithaca, New York. She's affiliated with, affiliated with multiple hospitals, and she is a true digital pathology trailblazer. So recently, Digital Pathology Place started working with a new partner, Smart in Media. And when I was in conversations with them, I was just asking, oh, who is using your camera? Just to understand better what you can do with it. And they told me, you need to talk, talk to Dr. Plohartwick. And um, so I reached out to Beth and asked about her digital pathology journey. And today I'm honored to have her as a guest on the podcast. And I'm so excited to have you here, Beth, because you have such a non-standard digital pathology journey. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the invitation. We are going to start with you, uh, with your background and what your pathology practice looked like before digital pathology was part of it. Sure. Um, so I'm a community hospital pathologist. I practice in Ithaca, New York, like you mentioned. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm, I'm anatomic and clinical pathology boarded, also boarded in dermatopathology and clinical informatics. So I do have an interest in technology use in medicine. Um, but for the first approximate decade of my practice, I hadn't used any digital pathology tools. I had a pretty standard practice. Um, mostly uh, surgical specimens, biopsies, excisions, cytology, some autopsies, uh, medical direction of laboratories, pretty standard uh, run-of-the-mill community hospital pathology. So you have a lot of specialties and were you using them enough before digital pathology? It's kind of a side question because you're boarded in informatics and you said that 10 years uh, you were not doing any digital pathology. Right, right. Uh, mostly my informatics training I was using for things um, having to do with data flow in medicine and making sure, um, you know, building interfaces with uh, other um, uh, practices. I have a pretty active uh, outreach practice because of my dermatopathology mm -hmm. practice. So I do service a lot of clients all over the state who are dermatologists. And there are lots of heterogeneous medical record systems that we had to get our, our medical record system to be able to talk to. And so mostly my informatics up to that point was having to do with uh, interoperability. <laughs> so you kind of, with this background, you were set up for success. Because digital pathology also is just part of, you know, a different ecosystem that goes into it. But uh, when did you decide to go digital? When was the point where you said, okay, it's time to go digital? And was it just for certain areas? Or how did you do it? And how did you know that digital was the way? Right. So after about 10 years of practice, I found myself in a one-person practice. Normally, my practice was a two-person practice. And then um, then I found myself working alone and I found, you know, having to do all of the work with one person, uh, it was very challenging to be able to be in multiple places at once. And even just simple things like 
you know, scheduling a dentist appointment or, you know, taking some time to do some gardening at home. It was very challenging to be able to uh, have have the time and ability to be able to do those things. Um, and so I, uh, I, I decided actually during the pandemic, it was in 2020, um, that it was time to go digital. And I remember the moment that I decided it was time. Uh, I was doing a proficiency test uh, at the, on the College of American Pathologists website, and it was a proficiency test in flow cytometry. And I remember looking at the uh, the images of the peripheral smear or the aspirate smear, and it was the the quality of the images was just excellent. The usability was easy. I was able to navigate the image um, and zoom in and zoom out without a lot of fuss. And I just remember this being a, a, a big change from what I remember digital imaging being when I was in residency. And so I thought, you know, this is a tool that can help me, uh, help me in my practice. And by that point, I was getting socialized to things like remote work because of pandemic, uh, being able to do meetings online, um, having other, you know, people that didn't have to be in the hospital uh, could could not be in the hospital with uh, with the pandemic and, and remote work. And so I think just a confluence of factors fell together. Also at the same time, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we had been doing a lot of uh, COVID testing and because COVID testing wasn't available, we had to develop it ourselves. Uh, and so we, we had to use the laboratory developed test way pathway in New York State to be able to do um, uh, this sort of testing. And that put in my mind, well, if we're using laboratory developed testing for COVID, why not use it for digital pathology? <laughs> so all of those factors just came together and I decided it was time uh, and that I needed to do it to be able to, uh, to be able to maintain my practice as a one person practice or even as a two person practice because times have changed so much. <laughs> yeah. Two person practice is not a huge practice. No. Either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, you decide to go digital. Can you describe like what was impossible before you went digital when you were just one person? Like what what would you run into? Like right. how many places did you have to drive to? How right. long was to drive? And <laughs> like yeah, when did you when did you realize hey it cannot continue like that? Right. Um, so I would say that there were certain. Uh, aspects of my practice that very much geographically located me within the hospital. And mm -hmm. one of those was frozen sections. Um, if you have a frozen section and it's six o'clock and you want to go home and eat dinner, you can't really do that if you're, you know, you're waiting for that frozen section unless you have some sort of uh, technology to be able to extend your reach. Uh, the second application that really tied me to the hospital was on-site adequacy assessment for cytology specimens. We do a lot of rows in our hospital, uh, rapid on-site uh, examination and evaluation um, to triage cytology specimens for FNAs that are happening in radiology or in the OR uh, for EBISs, for example. So um, uh, I, I would say that there were several of those cases per day. And I also needed to be in two different hospitals. <laughs> um, and so sometimes I would find myself Driving. How far were they from? from <laughs> yeah, we live in a, a rural area, and and um, I'd be driving to the other hospital, and then I'd get a call saying we have a frozen section, <laughs> and so it would be problematic. Uh, I needed to be able to be in multiple places at once. I needed uh, to be able to go home sometimes. Um, so those were the the two indications that really tied me to the hospital, and then there was a third indication that really tied me to the area, and that was dermatopathology. Um, so mm -hmm. being a dermatopathologist, I mentioned before that I, I have um, an outreach business and a, a clientele of, of, of derma dermatologists all over the state. And dermatologists are very particular. They like 24-hour turnaround time. Uh, and, you know, up into this uh, up into this time, you know, for the, the previous decade before I had digital pathology, I'd actually not left Ithaca on vacation um, oh because goodness. I was so committed to giving them their 24 hour turnaround time. And, you know, the only way that I could have done that before was being physically present in the place where the slides were. But because it's not a huge part of my business, um, you know, it was it's not so burdensome to be able to do an hour or two of sign out of just the germ path cases, you know, while I'm while I'm on vacation, but on vacation before was previously, you know, gardening leave in my own yard. 
Um, but then I thought, wow, you know, if I had digital pathology and whole site imaging, I could sign out these cases, you know, from France, maybe or from somewhere else. <laughs> so that was my third use case that uh, really I got me thinking about um, basically geographically untethering me from the region. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's a super powerful something that um, I don't know is not that highlighted because it's more um connected with the pathologist well-being and with the pathologist being able to do their job rather than um patients right it's mm -hmm. on the pathologist side to have a certain quality of life or to have a certain flexibility and uh, what i'm hearing then okay if you didn't have digital pathology it would and you would still be on your own are you still in your own? Or you no, have... it took me 14 months, though, to recruit okay. another pathologist. And that's another factor that was a huge, um, you know, player into, into this decision was, um, you know, the recruitment environment uh, now still, but even especially in 2021, when I was recruiting, was very challenging, very difficult. There's a huge shortage of pathologists and we're all expected now to to do more and to stretch ourselves even further so we just need the tools to be able to make ourselves even more efficient and to extend ourselves as far as we can to work at the tops of our licenses mm -hmm. yeah so without the tools you would probably have to um cut the number of patients because i don't know not be able to serve so much. how many hospitals are you affiliated with two hospitals no. yeah two and hospitals. multiple um physician offices and then we mm -hmm. also run the medical examiner program for the county it's a rural area so you kind of have to be a jack of all trades in this area um and uh you know it's it's one of those things where um if you if you didn't have uh you know, if, if, if you couldn't, if you couldn't do it, it couldn't get done <laughs> or there'd be yeah. delays or things it's not that mm -hmm. out and <laughs> totally, it's not the scenario with, oh, I cannot uh, work with this pathologist. Then I'm going to go to another one. There is no other one. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So you identified a couple of areas where digital pathology would be a game changer. How did you choose the right tools? Yeah. Uh, when you were looking into tech, how did you pick what to go with? And yeah, did you check a lot of systems or did you have recommendations? How did you go about it? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that you do is you determine your use cases. So those were my use cases. Uh, rapid on-site assessment for cytology, frozen sections, and uh, dermatopathology. So I knew I needed relatively low throughput uh, technology. I didn't need something that was going to be scanning, you know, 200 slides at a time. Um, I was looking for something that had, um, I was looking for whole slide imaging capacity and live view capacity, because I figured that the for the rapid on-site adequacy assessment, live view would probably be, um, meet my needs better. Um, mm -hmm. And then I decided on, um, most, a lot of people go for live view for frozen sections, but I decided to do whole slide imaging for frozen sections as well as for dermatopathology. So I was mm -hmm. looking for a few different types of technology. I was looking, uh, budget was a huge constraint for me because, you know, I'm a single solo practitioner. Um, so I set a budget and, um, and you know, those, those were the, um, the main two uh, uh, like functional specifications that I had is it had to meet my budget, it had to meet my use cases, and then it also had to be easy to use. Like I needed technology that, like I mentioned before, I'm often called when I'm driving from one hospital to another. If the, if the technology was going to tie me to a computer, it wasn't going to be functional for me. I needed it to work on a tablet, <laughs> which, you know, I can take pretty mm -hmm. much anywhere with me. Um, and so I needed to be able to like pull over to the side of the road and pull something up on a tablet to be able to make, um, you know, make decisions rapidly off of that. I wanted to be able to use it easily on the tablet. I didn't want to have to log into another system and, and like, pretend like I was VPN using the and... <laughs> and, You know, I wanted to use my finger and, you know, mm -hmm. move the image with my finger. I wanted to pinch to make it bigger. I wanted to pinch to make it smaller. Um, so those were, that was pretty critical functionality to me. So I think it's really important to define your functional specifications that you have in order to, um, to make sure that the technical specifications meet the functional specifications. 
So you say uh, a lot of people go for live view for frozen section, but you decided to go for whole slide imaging. Why did you decide? And did you have any problems with that? Yeah. What's the reason why people, why people do live view for that? There thing? are lots of systems out there for, um, you know, frozen sections with the trundle that you can manually move from afar. I was priced out of those types of systems mm -hmm. um, for the... Um, um, for the live view that I was using for cytology, the cytotech would be moving the slide. And so the mm -hmm. cytotech has, you know, some idea, you know, cytotech knows knows what they're looking at. And um, so I could say, oh, hey, stop at that, you know, that group of cells over at three o'clock and go in there. Um, so, and, you know, I, I could be having that conversation with the, with the cytotech, but um, with the phrasing section, you know, being the only pathologist, I would pretty much be the only one that be knowing what's being looked at. And I would feel less mm -hmm. comfortable telling, you know, a histotech on the other side, oh, hey, uh, stop on that thing that looks kind of square and, you know, <laughs> move over there. And, yeah. um, so that was one reason. And then the price was another. And then the third reason was because, um, you know, I'm, I was getting, uh, this was my first foray into whole slide imaging. And I mm -hmm. wanted to sort of push it to see what could I do with whole slide imaging. I wanted to also have a, you know, a little more, um, value for uh for the investment that i was making in the whole slide imaging rather than just for when i occasionally wanted to go on vacation and um you know out of the area and and wanted to read those germ path slides so i wanted to be able to get a little more value for my money so that was the the reason that i decided for whole slide imaging for um for the frozen section use case and the quality is good enough right Quality is excellent. I am um, really uh, impressed by the quality of, you know, very affordable scanners um, for, uh, and, and the time that it takes to scan is not uh, prohibitive. Um, it, it's working out, you know, very well, even for that intraoperative setting. So I know a frozen section images only from this, there's a data set, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. They have a bunch of slides and several of them are uh, frozen sections. Uh, in general, frozen sections are not as beautiful as uh, FFPE samples, but they're not going to be more beautiful on glass. Right. It's not that a scanner <laughs> is making those sections more ugly. They just are like this and you have to work with it. Right. So um, you just get what you get. <laughs> right. And uh, the, the scan doesn't make it any worse. So, okay. Going back to the budget. How did you, uh, if it's okay for you, can yeah. you tell us what your budget was for yeah. this whole setup? Yeah. And then we're going to dive into what you bought for this money. But first, what was the budget and how did you come up that this was a reasonable budget for you that would it not gonna like put you out of business or put you deep into debt? Right. So I was practicing alone at this point. Um, so I did have a little bit of flexibility because I wasn't paying another pathologist to be doing work. Um, so I, I basically just set a budget that was $75,000. I thought, you know, for $75,000, I should be able to get a solution or several solutions that will, you know, meet my needs and meet my use cases. I also didn't want to like dive really, I mean, one, I didn't have more money than that to spend. That was the top of my budget. Uh, and then two, I was thought, you know, it, I'm, I'm, this is my initial foray into, uh, into digital pathology. So I, you know, I, 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 I mean, it would have been nice if I had a lot more money to spend, but, you know, just knowing that I, you know, that, that this was my initial foray into it, I thought, okay, well, that's, I think that's a, that's a reasonable budget to, to set, to be able to meet my needs, especially since my needs were low throughput. If my mm -hmm. needs were higher throughput, I think that would have been a little more challenging. Um, or, and if, or if my needs were to like completely transform my, my workflow, uh, but they weren't, you know, I just had these special use cases just to get me out of the hospital for very certain things that were absolutely tying me to the hospital. Okay, so what did you decide to get and where did you distribute uh, these these devices? Right, so my evaluation process basically was uh, see what's out there. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I did internet searches and, mm -hmm. and you know, looked in, um, you know, resources like CAP Today and just to see what, you know, what was out there. Um, I started contacting vendors and just talking to people, asking questions, asking, you know, how much their devices cost and 
Um, and, you know, I was very quickly uh, dissuaded from many <laughs> products because of my budget um, uh, to be able to meet all of my all of my use cases. Um, so I um, uh, actually the vendors were very helpful, even some of the vendors for the large FDA approved devices that um, mm -hmm. that I was not able to access because of budget. Um, you know, they actually would point me into other directions and say, hey, you should call this vendor. They have some really nice products for, you know, for somebody like you who's looking for something much smaller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's that's kind of how it happened. Um, I just evaluated lots of different um, scanners. Uh, I found um, so I found I ended up buying two whole slide imagers and one live view scanner. Um, and the software platform that I've been using for uh, for the whole slide imaging, um, and so the the two um, uh, whole slide imagers I chose were it was a, a Motec um, six slide imager uh, and a Grandium Ocus twenty one slide I know imager. This one. I liked the fact that I could have two of these uh, scanners, so I'd have some redundancy if one of them went down. I'd be able to use the other. I also just kind of, you know, being informatics sported and kind of like tech nerd, I just wanted to play with the technology. I thought it was really interesting and really cool. And, you know, the scanners, they were affordable. You know, the the Modic, it was somewhere, it was under $30,000. The Grendian was under 15. Um, and the, um, the, the live view camera that I ended up getting was, was from the Spartan Media. It was their product mm -hmm. for, uh, for live view. And, um, and, one of the reasons that I that I also ended up going with the live view is because they also had a very nice web application um, that was available and also in my price range. They had one that that's not in my price range, but they also had one that was in my price range for just you know scanning like to be able to store images on a cloud based platform to be able to you know access them and log in and and look at them and move them around on an iPad with your finger and <laughs> determine what was going on. So mm -hmm. I, I wasn't able, you know, at this stage of the game to, to um, you know, do things like, um, uh, you know, interfacing with our medical record system or lots mm -hmm. more sophisticated things that I hope to someday be able to do with digital pathology. But this was just, you know, this is just getting getting my feet wet. <laughs> yeah, I like that you say that vendors are were helpful. And I'm seeing this uh, a lot more in this digital pathology space they really want to help and also they have especially for people who are new to what's out there they have already served some people and they know the use cases they know why people went with a certain system and didn't go with another one and they can very quickly point you in the right direction so and uh, yeah i like that a lot question where is the grandium located the modic and where's the live view Right. So right now, the because Grandium, I'm looking at your microscope, but there is nothing. No, there's it. nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, so the um, the Grandium is actually going to eventually live here. This is my home office. Mm -hmm. I have a home office and a hospital office. Um, but right now it's it's um, it's still being validated for one of my use cases. Uh, and so I'm validating it in the hospital. Uh, it's living right next to the Modic scanner. Modic mm -hmm. lives in, in the in the hospital. Um, and then so their um, bodies right now. Right. So when the you know, wherever the slides are being made so that they can be scanned by technical personnel. Um, and then um, the idea with the Grundium is is that, uh, if I'm signing out at home and, you know, my second pathologist is in the hospital and we're in different places, I could quickly scan something to him so he could mm -hmm. see it uh, as well and, you know, weigh in on it. Um, uh, and that way we don't have to do our, our usual thing of, hey, what do you think of that? <laughs> you know? so, putting the phone to the microscope yeah. and trying to catch the, the very first digital pathology. <laughs> I remember so, when the first and, cameras came out, I was still in vet school and it was the first time because we, when we learned histology and then later pathology, we had to draw these pictures and like to, we had a special workbook with circles. Half of the circle was either a picture or already a drawing. And then we had to look under the microscope. And then at some point somebody had the first digital camera and we were exactly trying to capture anything from the ocular <laughs> with the digital camera. 
that was an interesting exercise. I mean, you some people I see on social media, they get decent pictures. We never do it, yeah. I just don't have the uh, patience or like the dexterity to do yeah. it. I have a I have a specific um, adapter for this. Mm -hmm. um, I have the smart in media as well. Okay, yeah. so another question regarding the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you had it already? Um, let's see. It's been almost three. No. Yeah, three, three years, three years. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And how long did it take you to pick everything, validate, like from right. the day where you said enough, I need digital pathology to the day where you actually could uh, use it? Oh, that's a great question. Because uh, there was also a pandemic going on and I was practicing alone. It took me a while. Um, so the day I said, I'm going to get digital pathology, that was in September of 2020. And I set myself a deadline to December of 2020 to choose my technology. And I stayed on mm -hmm. track and I, I chose it and I made my purchases by the end of 2020. I got all of the technology, you know, the following month. So January 2021. Mm -hmm. And then um, the easiest thing to validate was, I think the thing I validated most quickly was uh, frozen sections. I think that mm -hmm. that one went easy because I was able to use a lot of archival material. Um, oh, yeah, true. And yeah, and I I ended up validating that one first because of my need to kind of get out of the the hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that was your your most narrow bottleneck, I think. Yeah, yeah. And we were valid. I was validating concurrently the live view, which is living on our our rose camera in the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's on a cart that goes to cytology. Or I need to, to go to one hospital one time and make a video of how they have mobile digital pathology on the microscope driving it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, I, I say it took me about nine months to get all of the validations just completed with the data and all the scanning and just, you know, reviewing everything. Um, submitted it all to the state. And I was using it even before I heard back from the state. Um, mm -hmm. but the state, you know, chimed in, I would say six or eight months later <laughs> okay. about that. So it, it, it took about a, I would say a, a good year of, mm -hmm. of validating, but I'm, I was a little bit constrained <laughs> just in my situation, just to be able to get everything done. Yeah, you were on your um, own. Also Please. for the Rose, the onsite access. Yeah. The onsite ask we took me a little bit longer to validate as well, because the way we chose to validate it since it was a live view was, you know, in real time, just kind of using it first and then doing our normal process and seeing how well they mm -hmm. uh, how well they compared so we had to wait till we had enough cases to be able and that took a few months uh to mm -hmm. be able to get enough cases to to compare them so but yeah so we did the validation submitted it and it's it's been great you know it's 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 definitely liberating <laughs> to be to be able to use the technology i like using it um, I'm getting used to, you know, seeing the images. Uh, some images are easier than others to see. I did decide at one point that I, I didn't want to do huge um, excisions for subtle melanomas or subtle melanocytic mm -hmm. lesions. I didn't want to use the digital for that, uh, okay. for, you know, like multi-slide cases, at least the way that I mm -hmm. have it currently set up because it's not integrated into the EMR. It's, it's not perfect. Um, but for small biopsies, the basal cells, the, you know, the, um, the frozen sections are fine. Uh, everything looks very, very good on it. We had some trouble validating um, um, the special stains um, because we were having, uh, it took us a little, a little while to, to overcome that hurdle um, because the, the scanner was focusing in the plane of section where the, um, where the marker was instead of on the tissue. Oh, okay. And um, so we ended up having to erase all of our marker lines on our slides and, you know, rescan all of those and try again. And that worked um, to be able to, to do that. So <laughs> marker lines, like with, with the pen? Yeah. Like with the sharp, oh. dividing the area where the controls are versus the tissue. Oh, okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> See, yeah, those cameras really be yeah. vigilant about these things that like, are so obvious for us, but then a device doesn't really distinguish. Right. Um, so, okay, so you've been doing this for three years. Let's say uh, you wanted to go one step further. Uh, and let's let's imagine a budget is not a constraint. What would you add to your digital pathology arsenal, like to make it even more 
liberating, mm-hmm. uh, increasing the access to patient care? What yeah. would be the next thing? Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a specific device, but like a use case. Which use yeah. case would, would, would you the, take under the digital pathology umbrella? The two next steps that I think are uh, most critical to accomplish would be interoperability with the medical record system mm-hmm. and higher throughput scanning. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that I would I would be able I would like to get one of those you know larger fancier scanners that is able to do you know all the GI biopsies or whatever. Um, uh, I think high throughput scanning would be would be very nice um, and interoperability with EMARS is absolutely critical mm-hmm. because I think that if if I were integrating this into into um, my my daily sign out in a way um, that you know, enables me to maintain efficiencies and, and, and actually, you know, read multiple slides, uh, in a day, not just, you know, a select few. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would definitely need to, I would want to be able to click on the image and know that the image that I'm clicking on is the one that's with that case. I'd like to open up the report concurrently with it and to be able to dictate into the report. Um, and so that's my dream. And that's actually what I'm, I'm working on next is the interoperability and the EMR. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping this will work out. It's, it's very, it's challenging when you, you don't really have a big budget. So So how are you approaching it? Are you, are you looking for some third party solution? Are you trying to, um, do like custom coding? What's your yeah, approach to that it, one? It's um, it's one of those things. So we we have an opportunity in that our hospital system is is changing EMRs, and so mm-hmm. you know we're moving to um, yeah, we're moving to a, like a more modern uh, medical record system than than we've had before. So there's lots of opportunities with that, and uh, you know with with my informatics background, I'm very heavily invested in in the EMR. You know, getting it, um, making sure that it's it's very functional and it works well for all the users and, and that it's configured properly. And, and one of the things that I, I had been looking into that with that is, um, you know, digital pathology and, and the way it integrates into the EMR. The mm-hmm. EMR, it doesn't, uh, it, you know, at this stage in the game, it's only interoperable with the, the FDA approved vendors, the big oh. expensive scanners that, you know, I don't have access to. So this is one of the kinds where I'm trying to work with Smart Media to um, mm-hmm. I'll see if we can integrate their product into it because it was a, it was a little more budget friendly for me and for my hospital. So uh, I'm hoping it'll work. Uh, it's you know it'll be a first. So if it works, it'll be it'll be very exciting. Um, but it's uh, it's new territory. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is amazing. So. Okay, um, this is the ideal world where everything is integrated. How does the day-to-day practice look right now with those parts of your workflow being digital pathology? Most yeah. is on the glass. Uh, you do it both from the hospital and from home, depending mm-hmm. where you're located. And mm-hmm. where does the digital pathology, h- how do you work with, with images? Yeah. Um, so for me right now, um, I basically, since there are two pathologists there, if one of us is in the hospital and there's a frozen section or rapid on-site assessment, or if I'm in the hospital and my derm, cath- derm path cases are there, or, you know, a courier can bring them here to my house, um, then, you know, I'm my preferred workflow is glass. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. definitely, it's easier mm-hmm. for me. And the other pathologist, you know, feels pretty much the same way. Um, but, uh, for, there are times of day that we like to make ourselves more available to the radiology staffing, um, often on the peripheries of the day when our, you know, our, when our normal histology, uh, like when we're done with the glass, we have no reason to be in the hospital other than to be there for, you know, the frozen section or that radiology procedure. And in those instances, we use, we heavily rely upon, uh, the onsite adequacy assessment. So what'll happen is, you know, if there's a, an early morning procedure or a late afternoon procedure and the pathologist is not in house, um, they will, the cytotech will go up and do the rows, send us a link via the path of zoom camera. We'll log mm-hmm. in. We look at it just like it's a movie. We watch, like I'll just watch it on my iPad, you know, say, yeah, that looks good. Uh, yeah, that looks somatopoietic, you know, send some for flow or, oh, there's some, you know, neutrophils in there let's culture it or oh yeah look that, that looks epithelial let's get a cell block you know all the all the traditional uh-huh. like uh, rows that we're doing mm-hmm. uh, triage and um so that that's 
been great. And it's, it's a real, um, it was a real appealing um, feature when I was recruiting. Uh, for for my patho other pathologists, Definitely. you know, I could very say, much was be for me if I was looking for a job. Yeah, <laughs> you know, when it's when it's getting later in the day and you want to go home and have dinner with your family, <laughs> you can do that. Uh, pathologists because... <laughs> like doing that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we like to do that. Um, yeah. And you know, it, it's that waiting for a frozen section isn't going to stop you because. So mm -hmm. I, I I very much enjoy doing that because you know the ORs don't always run on time and. Uh, a lot of the cases that we get frozen sections for, most of our frozen sections are plastic surgery cases. So they're not mm -hmm. as, you know, critical as maybe some other cases. And so if more, you know, pressing cases come in, the plastic surgery ones get pushed. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we might be seeing those later, later in the day when we're done with all of our routine work and we have no reason to be in the hospital. So, so do they like text you and say, hey, uh, open your computer and scan yeah. the code for yeah, the they'll say hey um so for the frozen sections um basically the 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 workflow is the technologist who is preparing the frozen section will scan the slide uh you know give me a call or send me a text and say hey uh we just started scanning the slide it should be uploaded in a couple minutes um and uh and then i log in to the you know on the ipad no matter where i am it's you know i very easy to always have the tablet with you, you know. <laughs> and so I could be out to dinner, I could be in the dentist office, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and I and I can take care of that frozen section, you know, as soon as it uploads, call the surgeon, let him know what I'm seeing. Uh yeah, and then it's it's just done. <laughs> Perfect. You know that what I did recently, I just got the uh, smart and media camera and I had a lecture for non pathology students about pathology data. Uh, and I did a demo for them and let them uh, guess what slides I, I had on the stage. And I just had them scan the QR code. And of course, the first thing that they started to do is draw on it and annotate and like draw circles and hearts. I'm like, that's at least interactive, good teaching tool as well. <laughs> so that was fun. Beth, you are working with community hospitals. And mm -hmm. um, how did they react to this new cutting edge tech? Uh, and like, what was their uh, reaction to you proposing this um, going digital or maybe did you do it together? How was that when you yeah, I suggested? A, yeah, I have a very ho uh, supportive hospital environment. So um, administration gets it, especially I think COVID really got us to a point where we were understanding, um, you know, utilizing technology to extend us and to be able to you know, we were used to doing Zoom meetings where, you know, we're sitting in our homes and, you know, babies walk into the room and climb up in people's laps and, you know, dogs come across the Zoom camera and cats are walking all over. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we just, we got used to that. We got used to doing, you know, our two reports now are all Zoom. Um, and so we, they, you know, the idea of, of using technology to people to extend the resource, they saw what, working alone was doing to me <laughs> they saw yeah. you know they saw how hard it was they saw how hard the recruitment environment was um they saw how how difficult it was to recruit for other specialties as well so i mean i think that that administration gets it as a tool um and they're also very supportive in trying to to help me with my crazy scheme of trying to become interoperable uh, with with the medical record system so I think um, it's it's very helpful to have a supportive hospital environment. They didn't have extra money to throw at it, but they, you know, they were basically, they knew that this technology would help me extend the resource so that I could provide more services. You know, mm -hmm. I could make, I could say, okay, listen, we can have frozen section hours, you know, that are longer because... Um, I'm available, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm more available, you know, like I, I can't be available if I have to go to this hospital and we don't want to limit procedures. I never want to be the rate limiting factor in a procedure. Um, and so I think that, you know, showing them this allows me to not be the rate limiting factor is good for hospital, you know, throughput and bottom line and patient care and all of these things too. So the hospital reacted pretty well. Um, I think it's it's sometimes a little challenging um, with the frozen sections because it does extend the turnaround time a little bit for me since I am using whole slide imaging. So they're not, you know, they're used to being able to slide have the slide ready, on the glass, uh, have the mm -hmm. instant answer. Now there's a, you know, a slight delay of the few minutes that it takes to upload the image. And 
And I think sometimes the surgeons um, who, you know, I don't think they belong to the most technology. patient group of professionals oh. either. Yeah, they're they're pacing back and forth. And so I, I think that there's, you know, it's, but I, I feel like once once people get used to it and, and, you know, once surgeons are coming in that you've, have seen this in use for their entire careers or have seen, you know, me using this for the uh, for their my entire career or the, my entire career that they've been with me, then they'll mm -hmm. just see it as normal. And so I think yeah. that, you know, over time it becomes, people get used to it. So <laughs> the technologists but, like it. They, the technologists yeah. in the laboratory love having um, tech uh, that, you know, that it's, it's, even though it's more work for them to scan stuff, they, they see what it does. They see that it extends the reach and that it, you know, makes things easier and, and allows for, you know, allows for other use cases as well. We're using it now for tumor boards. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've been looking at how can we use this to save money with our send out costs? Can we use, can we scan the images to uh, the place, the hospitals where the patients are going for second opinion rather than, you know, FedExing slides yes. and tracking numbers and, you know, things like that. So I think that we, they see that there's possibilities with it. And, and also not, technologists love technology, right? So, right, they're technologists. Right. But I was not, see, I recently only learned about this uh, requirement. And then when somebody's going somewhere for second opinion, this the slide and uh, the, the specimen, the bi diagnosis was made of has to go with them because mm -hmm. their pathologist has to confirm. Right. Uh, and I learned it in the context uh, of, yeah, of doing this digitally instead of sending glass because sometimes it would take longer to uh, ship the glass there than to bring the patient. Yeah, yeah. And it's very expensive because, you know, you have to make sure that there's tracking numbers on these specimens, that they are good, that they go quickly. Sometimes, you know, we're sending them overnight and that can get very, very expensive, especially if you're sending to multiple different hospitals every day. Um, you know, which yeah, we true. do because <laughs> patients go, you know, all, all over. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's definitely, it's, it, it could maybe even help offset some of the, the costs of, of purchasing the technology. If you can, you know, use these as justifications as, you know, this is, this is going to ultimately help us in the long run. And I think the, the real justification is the pathologist resource because we are the most scarce, you know, there's, it's, yeah. it's, it's very, it's a very challenging, uh, recruitment environment. Um, you know, it's, it's now that people are kind of used to having a little more flexibility with work, there's, people are demanding it. And so if, if we can, if we can help provide that, <laughs> then, you know, if there's yeah, technology yeah. that can support us in that, then we should definitely be exploring it. And I hope we get there. I, I mean, the radiologists in our hospital are a hundred percent. They do that, right? And yeah, they've been the using same rural area that you are. Yeah, like what's the what's the deal? Pathologists yeah. can have that too. Yeah, and I feel like radiologists are are pretty far ahead of pathologists in in the digital uh, landscape. Yes. Um, I feel like they've been digitizing things for much much longer, um, and so I don't know. Maybe in, in twenty years we'll be at like the radiology level of of normalization of this technology and adoption mm -hmm. into our daily lives, but. Um, but it's it's exciting to uh, to be on the leading edge of it and to be you know adopting it in early and innovative ways and trying to mold it to to meet my needs and meet my practice. It's very satisfying to uh, to accomplish it when it when it works. <laughs> so your practice owns all the tech, mm -hmm. and you basically have it where it needs to be used. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Understood. and I I needed to do it that way because. One of how rapid I, I my timeline was and how quickly I mm -hmm. wanted to move, you know, I, I wasn't going to be able to wait for capital cycles and apply for things. And and also, you know, is the hospital environment, they have so many priorities that are competing. Uh, this was my, you know, number one competing priority. So I knew that if if I wanted to make this happen, it was going to have to be my practice that that ponied up the capital for it. Um, so that was, that was my, um, reasoning for it. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's been working out. The technologists are the ones who are truly, you know, doing all of the scanning, using, mm -hmm. using it in, in the day to day. And, and I'm just sort of the, the end user beneficiary of it. I think it's extremely empowering that you could, like you say, okay, that was my priority and I did it. I chose what I needed to choose and 
I brought it to them. They said yes, and we can now do it uh, because you know you were also in the in the position that you're working with multiple institutions, um, so so you're the driving force. But I think this story is basically empowering others in your position and others who work independently. Hey, we can be the drivers of this. We don't have to just like say yes if somebody offers this to us we can consider on our own if it's going to bring more business into the practice, if it's going to increase the access to care, if it's going to increase the flexibility of our life. And if the answer is yes, hey, let's budget and let's do it. Like Absolutely. Do I think this is so cool. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's super cool. Yeah. So if someone else was in a similar spot and was thinking about getting into digital pathology, what's your advice? Or like, what are the traps that they should avoid? Yeah. Or, I don't know, something that maybe you would do differently right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, I think compliance reasons scare a lot of people. I think people are very mm -hmm. frightened of technology that's not FDA approved. I think people find that it's, um, that's a barrier and it shouldn't be. Um, people should be able to access the non-FDA approved technology. You're going to have to do the same validation anyway when you're internally True. validating it. And the College of American Pathologists gives you really good resources. I mean, they basically tell you, you know, step by step what you need to do in order to produce a validation that's considered acceptable, which is, you know, it's just like any other laboratory test, right? Um, so if you just approach it like any other laboratory test and, and, um, uh, I, I think that just knowing that that there are options out there that aren't FDA approved um, and that the, the validation, the internal validation that you're going to have to do is going to be exactly the same, whether it's FDA approved or not FDA approved. So really, you know, like if you think the technology is good, then it's good enough, right? Because <laughs> you're the, you are if the you standard. as a board certified pathologist right. decide that you can do diagnosis on yeah. this and, you know, compare it to whatever CAP says. It's, I think it's 60 cases yeah. that you have. Yeah. Anyway, then that's what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a huge thing because I, I remember, you know, very early on, you know, when I would tell people about this, they'd be like, but, but. You, you know, you're going to get in trouble with uh, the regulating, regulating bodies and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I don't think so. Like, it's you know, like they give you paths to do, uh, you know, laboratory approved tests in the state. You know, like I, I followed it and the state said, OK. And <laughs> so I think it's, you know, it's 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 definitely I think people consider that a, a barrier. And it's probably just because, you know, not a lot of people are are doing it you know the way i did it and it's just sort of an individual mm -hmm. who is just needs it like needs it to function yeah. <laughs> um, and so i think just sort of if you if you have that need like one overcome that barrier um and then i think that the other barriers that that people tend to have would be um definitely the the financial barrier and also the barrier of um, making sure that your your hospital administration or whatever the you know administration that you're working with um, is is on board and can provide you know technical resources and is supportive of the technology and, and agrees that it meets you know HIPAA compliance and that um, you know data privacy standards and all of these all of these things that are that are out there um, you know the the you know making making sure that that you have a, a supportive environment and from from that perspective to be able to to meet those those barriers, I think is is also pretty critical. Um, there was I one to, at one point um, our uh, uh, my access to the 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 data platform where um, where the images were stored was blocked because this was right when Russia invaded Ukraine. <laughs> Then and the hospital decided to block all, um, you know, all European, uh, you know, oh. web. <laughs> web smart smart media is from media. Germany, like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So smart media was blocked, and, and you know, it took me. It was you know one of those things that took me a couple days to work through mm -hmm. with my my IT staff. Like, no, this is. They're, you so know, safe. They're not going to start World to do War my III, job. You know, like, it's it's Germany. It's okay. <laughs> you know, like, oh my god. Oh, but yeah, so things, you know, things like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just evaluating things and, and keeping it moving forward and just, just, I, w I would say, um, 
I'm very satisfied with the technology I purchased. It works very well for me. It meets my needs. Um, and it definitely gives me um, sort of a footholds into the, the field that, you know, makes me ask more questions and make me think, makes me think of, you know, what I, what we're going to need the next level to do and what the next level to meet. And it's just, I'm approaching it very iteratively. And I think that, um, that's a, like, that's another thing too, is I would recommend for people approaching it iteratively. I can't imagine trying to dive in and completely redesign my workflow. I think that's another thing people get scared of. They're like, oh gosh, yeah. you know, like I love my microscope. I love glass, you know, like I don't want to move away from that, but you know, if, if you don't like, most of my work is glass. The, the digital stuff is just icing on the cake. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and I can see And that's okay, right? Because, yeah. you know, um, maybe not, now not so much anymore, but a couple of years back, it was like hospital, going digital, all, full digital, full like no glass anymore, everybody on the screen. And people who like don't have the luxury of, having an institution or like having a dedicated group coordinate that and coordinate the phasing out and then just going to digital think it's not accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And that's not, you just, you just use it iteratively and in a different way. So Beth, if you decided, okay, I want to grow my practice with digital pathology, be a tool that would help you grow it, like have another person or... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, like our hospital system is um, it, looking at affiliating with another hospital system. And mm -hmm. that other hospital system has had an extremely difficult time staffing their anatomic pathology lab. Um, they have a hard time staffing pathologists. Same thing, you know, recruitment environment. Mm -hmm. It's also mm -hmm. a very hard environment to recruit technologists, histotechnologists, cytotechnologists. It's very hard to get all of these, you know, all of these things in place. So I can see a future where we are, um, um, you know, consolidating resources for anatomic pathology for multiple institutions um, in, in a centralized environment and using the, um, the digital pathology, not only to share cases amongst pathologists, um, but to be able to do, you know, the frozen sections, the on-site adequacy assessment, even just daily sign out, I think if we can get to a point where we've got high throughput scanning slides. and good interoperability with the EMR, I can see a future, you know, especially if we're expanding and growing and that will help, um, that will help normalize the workload. It will help people be, you know, working at the tops of their licenses and be more efficient uh, to be able to work from anywhere. And it'll be attractive to recruit pathologists if we can tell them they can work at home, if they mm -hmm. want to work at home. Um, and, uh, I think that that's, you know, giving people that sort of flexibility, I, I think would be the next, the next steps is the higher throughput, the interoperability with the EMR and moving even more toward incorporating it into daily routines and, and sharing across geographic distances. I mean, when you're in a rural environment, it's, it's, you know, you've got a lot of space. Yeah, the hospital. yeah that is true. That is true. And not everybody wants to comment work in a hospital in a rural area and this is amazing i love your story i love very much how empowering and how like you just did it and that always gives um the the sets a super cool example and shows that it can be done you don't have to wait for anybody uh, if you need it just do it there is a way to do it without like going out of business and you can serve more, more patients and that there are budget friendly tools that can um, unblock the problem mm -hmm. yes thank you so much for joining me and thank you so much for, for telling my digital pathology trailblazers about how you did it you are a true pathology trailblazer oh, thanks Alex I appreciate the opportunity I love the technology I love sharing it the more of us that are out there doing it the better it will get it <laughs> yeah and then you know those who come after that's going to be what they see that's going to be what they're used to and there's not going to be any uh, there's not going to be so much fear there's not going to be so much misunderstandings because that's going to be what what they step into when they start yeah. practicing yeah. And yeah. the barriers will go down. The hospitals will want to adopt it because mm -hmm. everybody else is doing it. So. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying till the end. I felt this episode was really heartwarming when a person, a pathologist, a female pathologist from a one person practice can uh, help can go digital and can help more patients than she would without those tools and if you want to check two of the tools that beth was mentioning grandium the grandium microscope and the smart in media live view camera i will have them linked on the screen here or here you can check out in more details how those tools work and i talk to you in the next episode <laughs>